Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. Candidates continue to visit all areas of the state, and television, radio, and online ads are constant. We are a little more than one week away from South Carolina's Democratic primary, and the stakes continue to rise in the first in the South primary. The campaign volunteers are out knocking on doors, making last minute phone calls, and the candidates are saturating the airwaves and online with ads as they begin their final push ahead of the first in the South primary. Polls show an ever tightening race in a state that was a stronghold for former Vice President Joe Biden. With several moderates chipping away at Biden's base, Senator Bernie Sanders has taken to campaigning in nearby Super Tuesday state, North Carolina, where 2,000 recently turned out as he maintains a comfortable position in South Carolina. Tom Steyer remains a strong contender in the Palmetto State, and he has made inroads with a critical black voting base, while others were more focused on other early voting states. Now many of those candidates who haven't been around much are scrambling to scale up for South Carolina and the Super Tuesday primaries on March 3rd. A Tuesday debate remains between now and the primary, and many undecided South Carolinians will be watching. Joining us to discuss the 2020 campaign is Meg Kennard with the Associated Press and Jamie Lovegrove with the Post and Courier. Guys, welcome back. Good to be here. Happy to be here, Gavin. We are days away from the primary. Jesus. Can you tell me who's going to win? <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're counting well. or anything. But. Wow. Um, but I want to start off, Meg, by talking about Joe Biden. Obviously, he's been a big front runner in South Carolina for the past year and change. Um, and when people would ask us who's going to win South Carolina, we're like, well, we don't know who's going to win, but we can say Joe Biden's been maintaining uh, that lead, but so far that lead has been shrinking. What's going on with Joe Biden right now in South Carolina? It does feel really weird not to say, oh, he's had such a massive cushion, so obviously we know that Joe Biden's going to come out on top. He still may very well come out on top, but I feel like what we've seen happen is Joe Biden started from such a high threshold. I mean, he had so much support. His numbers were so high in terms of how, where his standing was in South Carolina. There was really nowhere to go but down. Mm. And as more candidates have become better known, as voters have become better educated, I feel like some of them have decided, you know, Joe Biden was the one that I knew and he was the name that I recognized the most and the one that I trusted. But these other people might be a good option. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of what we're seeing. Another part of what we're seeing is his previous performances in the states that have already voted and how while he was always managing expectations and saying I'm not going to win these places just wait till I get to South Carolina where it really is going to start to matter for me his numbers haven't been great and so I think we've seen some of that translate into lower numbers for him in South Carolina and some other places and we're getting really really close and it's it's really going to be a sprint from now on and Joe Biden really needs to come and shore up that support if he's going to be successful. Sounds like a make or break moment in South Carolina for him, Jamie. Absolutely, and of course this is the third Joe Biden presidential campaign. Um, he has never uh, looked strong after Iowa. Um, sometimes he can't make, you know, he's never made it here before. Mm -hmm. um, and this very much will be the last stand of a, of a 50 year career in politics. Um, and so yeah, he is depending on this state. Uh, certainly they're still hopeful for a strong performance out of Nevada. Um, where most polls have him in second place behind Bernie Sanders. Uh, and so that would be another, you know, at least stronger showing in a, in a more diverse state than Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, but, you know, yeah, he has made the case that the reason we shouldn't pay that much attention to Iowa and New Hampshire is because of how white they are and because that the backbone, the base of the Democratic Party is African-American voters. This is a state where a majority of, of the Democratic electorate is African-American. So he has to prove here that he is correct, um, that, that he has that diverse coalition. Uh, and if he doesn't, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for him to make the case moving forward. And he's going to get a, a ton more pressure from, from the establishment, from donors, um, from other party officials to drop out mm -hmm. because he would be at that point, the, the issue is that they're all concerned about Bernie becoming the nominee. So mm -hmm. if you are detracting from someone else who could potentially beat him, mm -hmm. a Bloomberg, a Pete Buttigieg, even Amy Klobuchar, mm -hmm. um, there's gonna be pressure to coalesce. But if you can come into South Carolina, you can show that you were right, you can win, then maybe the pressure will be on some of those other mm -hmm. candidates. Uh, the, the point is, this is going to be very important. Yeah, I mean, even more so South Carolina playing this prim big primary role. Mm -hmm. Meg, you were talking about uh, 
just how important Nevada will be for the vice president too. What are you hearing about what he needs to do out there in order to really springboard and gain that momentum going into South Carolina? I've been talking to Democratic strategists, as we all do, just about every day. But someone who's in Joe Biden's orbit and has been for quite some time told me yesterday that it's going to be very important for him to not just have a strong finish in Nevada, but to be one or two. Yeah. And if he's not in one of those positions, then coupled with the results from Iowa and New Hampshire, he's going to be in a very weak position coming into South Carolina. You know, Joe Biden has often talked about how this is home for him. Mm -hmm. um, someone told me yesterday, you know, realistically, he vacations here. So if he's not been wherever home has been, whether it's Washington or Delaware, he's been in South Carolina a lot of the time. So if he can't come to this place that he really considers to be a home, a mm -hmm. safe place, in a strong position out of Nevada, even if he's had a lot of support and popularity here and good poll numbers, it is going to be very difficult for that to translate into a win. The same strategist also told me that whatever happens in Nevada, if he comes into South Carolina and doesn't win it, it's likely going to be over for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about winning South Carolina, Jimmy, like, what is a win for Joe Biden? It's not just getting a little bit more than Bernie Sanders. It, what does it have to look like, I guess, for him to really be viable going forward in Super Tuesday states? Well, that is a question. You know, uh, I think we have been <coughs> saying up until this point that you want to have a resounding victory, mm -hmm. maybe even double digits, in order to send a message to the rest of the country that that you have this overwhelming support from African American voters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think because of the fact that it's gotten so much closer uh, in in most of the limited polls that we've seen over the last few weeks, those expectations may diminish a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And even just a narrow win may still give him something of a boost. Mm -hmm. um, it will, of course, be the first state he's ever won in a presidential primary mm -hmm. uh, nominating contest, a again, after three campaigns. Uh, and so that will be significant. It will probably feel uh, like a, a significant monkey off his back if he can if he can get that done mm. big if of course you know Nevada is going to be uh, tricky again for him because caucuses like we saw in Iowa mm -hmm. are not his strong suit in some ways because they can disadvantage uh, elderly voters voters with children who don't want to leave their kids alone because you have to go and do this in person um, and some of those demographics are core Joe Biden supporters yeah. um, you know so when we heard from Senator Dick Arbutley in South Carolina who went to mm -hmm. Iowa before the Iowa caucuses mm -hmm. he said you know I was running into all these voters who weren't gonna go they liked Joe Biden mm -hmm. but they didn't want to sacrifice all that time and so, even in Nevada with the early voting yeah. option right. I mean we saw people who were waiting in line for two, two yeah. and a half, three hours it's a really because they didn't process. they weren't gonna be able to come to the caucus. Yeah. But they just left the line saying, I can't stand here either. So right. that's that's another thing that's only gonna work to his disadvantage. And of course there will we'll, let's find out, of course I don't wanna <laughs> jinx <anything. laughs> I was about to say it. But you know, know let, let, let's be let's be yeah. blunt. There have been folks in Nevada, some county chairs, who have said they are worried yeah. that, that, that it is not going to go Iowa smoothly. 2.0, yeah. Um it may not be quite as disastrous as Iowa. At least they had they got to see Iowa so they could they could have something to prepare for and try to avoid. They, they're not using the app that was a disaster in Iowa. Um, but caucuses are difficult. I think there's probably going to be some serious conversations after Big this time. cycle about whether or not caucuses should continue to exist mm -hmm. in, in the Democratic nominating contest. Um, but again, that could muddy the picture coming into South Carolina and South Carolina, yeah. similarly to New Hampshire, could offer a clearer picture of, of the state of the race. Yeah, we'll get to, uh, we'll talk about whether we're going to have any clarity coming out of South Carolina, yeah. who knows. Um, but just kind of going back to the Super Tuesday, and we're going to switch to Bernie Sanders in a moment. But when we look at, you know, the momentum going to Super Tuesday, there are, I think there's six uh, of those of those 14 states are southern states. Mm -hmm. And southern states like to stick together somewhat when they, when they pick their... Uh, they're candidate for the most part. Well, we've seen some tight polls out of North Carolina and Virginia specifically. Sure. Um, so, Meg, I'm just wondering, like, if, if Biden does get a little bit of a win here in South Carolina, can he hope to maybe capitalize on that a little bit more in some of those southern states where, you know, you know, southern Democrats like a southerner. Joe, well, there's no southerner in this race. Some people say Joe Biden is that southerner in this race. Could that maybe give him a boost going? He's certainly hoping to capitalize on that. He has said, and he said it to me and probably others, that he views South Carolina as potentially his springboard into mm -hmm. the Super Tuesday states. The problem with Super Tuesday, there are a couple of things, but one of which is it comes so quickly after South right. Carolina. Mm -hmm. So there's really not a whole lot of time, even if there is that success in which he could bask, you know, that light of, oh, I won this primary, this should be really great for me. He has to move directly on mm -hmm. into all those other places. Also, there are several campaigns, 
Mike Bloomberg among them, <laughs> who are waiting like very, very much to really have that moment on Super Tuesday. He's right. been organizing there and pretty much only there. Mm -hmm. Remember, he's skipping these early days. So he's been focusing on Super Tuesday for a long time. There are other can campaigns. Bernie Sanders, we were with him in North Carolina last week. Mm -hmm. He has been focusing very heavily on Super Tuesday as well. So even if Joe Biden does come out of South Carolina with a win, he goes directly into Super Tuesday in a very, even more intense competition for all of those massive delegates that are at stake in you know those southern states, but also California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, we Humongous. talk about our delegates, and it is important. That there is a lot of math here, but California has like almost five times the delegates that we have here in South Carolina. So, so there are a lot of uh, a lot of things at play there. So a lot going forward to look at. We can't really count yeah. anyone out right now. I mm -hmm. mean, it's. Yeah. It's been bruising, but it's it's yeah. still we have to wait and see what really kind of happens. And here. I don't want to jinx this too, uh, but <laughs> Go right you know ahead. the uh, if we look further down the line, mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that every state in the Democratic primary, unlike the Republican primaries, is proportionally allocated, narrowly winning these states the way that Bernie Sanders has been doing, or the way that Joe Biden might do here, or the way that Mike Bloomberg might do in some of the Super Tuesday states actually doesn't gain you that much. You mm -hmm. may only get one more delegate than the person who comes in second place. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, increasing talk among a lot of the folks in democratic politics who have studied delegate math and know how this works, that it's extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to see the path for anyone mm -hmm. to 1,991 delegates, what you need to become the nominee, which of course leads to a lot of fun at the convention in Milwaukee <laughs> where we will all be this summer, a potentially broken convention. Yeah. You know, you're gonna start to see, after probably Super Tuesday, mm -hmm. campaigns talking maybe a little more uh, with each other about forming alliances mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how do we want to best approach this. Um, so the point is that Bernie is, is in the is in the you know driver's seat right now in this primary and Bloomberg may be in the passenger seat and Biden and some of the others are are right there with them. You're painting a great visual of all of these. <laughs> yeah. We got a we got a big uh, <laughs> a a big caravan. Yeah. But right. uh, the point is that that nobody is clearly yeah. en route mm -hmm. to becoming the nominee mm -hmm. and uh, that is going to make for some some interesting uh, few months ahead. Yeah, and, that, and that's yeah. something that allegedly this whole early primary and caucus process is supposed to help the party do, <laughs> to not necessarily coronate someone, mm -hmm. but to at least weed out the field and right. help voters kind of coalesce Which or we've figure done out some of. Yeah. Sort yeah. of. We've I mean, there have like been the very bottom but, and, uh, right again, people who are really likely going to be leaving the race in the yes. quickly yeah. anyway. So you know, yes. there there have been a lot of strong candidates in this campaign. Many of them are still left, right. and there uh, you know voters that we talk to at all of these things they're. Very very much still trying to figure this out because they don't feel like they had a lot of information mm -hmm. from the early And votes. something that uh, one particular strategist I was talking to mentioned too is that there is actually not very much incentive, even if you're not doing well, to drop out if yeah. you think that there will be a broker convention yeah. because you want to be in the room. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you know you're not going to be the nominee, if you've won some amount of delegates, right. yeah. you want something for those delegates. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want, you know, a position in the cabinet. You may want to be someone's running mate. You may, you know, th that's this yeah. is how these broker conventions work. They're extraordinarily rare, obviously. Just you need um, the money, I guess, to go on a mm -hmm. little bit longer, just kind of linger around. Stay I mean, in the and conversation. Of course, yeah. I should say there are skeptics who say, look, we talk about a broker convention every four years, and <sighs> it never ends up happening. But it's this, like catnip for reporters you know, right. and strategists. But like. this is a a rare <laughs> year right uh, to, yeah. to have this uh, packed of a field, mm -hmm. you know, with with folks, uh, several candidates, all who have a legitimate argument to stay in this race and to keep mm -hmm. going, certainly at least beyond Super Tuesday. You know, there are states where Biden is still doing quite mm -hmm. well in Super Tuesday polls. Georgia, mm -hmm. you know, our neighbors to uh, the southwest, mm -hmm. he's, he's looking quite strong in a lot of polls there, but Bernie's doing well in Texas, Bernie's doing well in California, Bloomberg is all over the place. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be very crowded, and yeah. that, that is gonna make things interesting even after South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of, um, you know, sticking with what we might be seeing from some of these top candidates in South Carolina, I wanna look at Bernie Sanders. Obviously, he's surging pretty well in other states, too, and mm -hmm. he's been maintaining strongly in South Carolina. I haven't seen him really move too much uh, down, just been steadily moving up in some cases. What's a win for Bernie look like, Meg? Is it se a solid second place? Is that just good enough for him to be like, hey, let's fine by us. I mean, we're here. I mean, that's kind of where it he was. It very well could be. Yeah. Um, compared to where Bernie Sanders was in South Carolina in 2016, right. yeah. this is a dramatically different conversation for him. We often talk about coming out of these races, even if the person who comes in first place can technically claim victory, it's if 
the person who has a surprising second or third place finish actually pr usually gets more attention. And so in this circumstance, you're right, Senator Sanders has been performing extremely well in national polls and, so, mm -hmm. and, and also in matchups um, when you look down the line toward November. So, you know, polls tell us they're, they're nice guideposts. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're not predictors. Yeah. Um, but coming off of that information, Senator Sanders is could be in very good position to do well here. And so, it, it, you know, if he could certainly have a close second place finish to Joe Biden, that would be extraordinary for him. And also in those other places in Super Tuesday where he's already been performing well and has mm -hmm. been campaigning um, and going to North Carolina and being in California and having these massive rallies that we've seen, um, mm -hmm. that certainly could put him in, in really good position to do well on that race as well. But then you hear from some down ballot candidates like Representative Joe right. Cunningham, yes. uh, uh, Jamie, and, and you talked with him. Uh, just right. kind of give me the, the feeling from these guys who are, you know, at these yeah. at risk districts. Right, and, and this, you know, the reason why I think this was such a, an interesting development is because Joe Cunningham is someone who's very focused on his district. He does not like talking about national politics because he just doesn't want to get drawn into these, you know, intra-party fights. Mm -hmm. But uh, he and many other moderate Democrats who flipped. Uh, you know, red districts blue in 2018 are terrified about the impact that they think Bernie Sanders would have at the top of the ticket on them. They are worried that the Republican candidates will paint them as as aligned with him, as radical socialists, as the Republicans like to say. Mm -hmm. They will do that anyway, right? But they will may have more credibility if Bernie Sanders is at the top of the ticket. So yeah, they're very worried, and so he spoke out and said that South Carolinians don't want socialism. He, he named Bernie Sanders and said that he doesn't want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee. He doesn't mm -hmm. think he will be the nominee. Um, so for arguably the second most influential Democrat in South Carolina behind Jim Clyburn at this point, to say that uh, is, is a significant sign of some of the concern that, that folks are seeing from moderate Democrats all over the country uh, about that possibility. Uh, you know, now what I will say about Bernie, too, is... You know, of course, he did get blown out here in 2016, and as a result, going into this cycle, you know, people were, you know, like, Bernie has no chance in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, he got 26%. It was mm -hmm. a two-way race, so right. he lost by 48, but he got 26%. 26% in South Carolina, because of how divided the field this is this year, field. could win. Right. Um, all he has to do, actually, is maintain his same base of support mm -hmm from 2016. In fact, he probably will not even be able to do that, um, despite, you know, mm -hmm. doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, he has also, and we'll, we'll probably talk about Tom Steyer yeah. too, he has benefited in some ways, it seems like, Certainly. from the polls, from the fact that Tom Steyer has been able to chip in to Joe Biden's lead, mm -hmm. particularly among African American voters. So as the two of them kind of come together, they are approaching sort of the equilibrium, which mm -hmm. is Bernie Sanders yeah. in the middle. Um, and he may end up being able to squeak out um, a surprising win after that, uh, which would send a, a huge message uh, <laughs> it, to mm -hmm. the rest of the country. Quite ironic for the candidate, Bernie Sanders, who's been talking for years about how billionaires are not the answer to things, <laughs> to actually potentially be elevated <laughs> like in, handy in, South in South Carolina, Carolina <laughs> by a billionaire candidate. Yes. Can we yes. talk about it, Tom Sarah, really Absolutely. quick, Meg? Yep. And, and just, I mean, we have seen him moving up in polls. Mm -hmm. Jamie just talked about how he's making inroads with black voters, and we're seeing that also in polls. Uh, we've been to several of his, of his, his events. Mm -hmm. uh, he had South Carolina to himself for many of these long stretches of time. Definitely. While else was in Iowa, New Hampshire. He's been just, you know, all over the airwaves, in mailboxes. People are now starting to do that, but he's had a big jump on that here. Mm -hmm. And it's been paying off, it looks like. So what, what's it like on the ground when we see folks at these events and what are they saying in terms of who their candidates are and if they're backing Tom Steyer? There are some people who say that they're already all in for him, that they really like the message and particularly among the African American voters that we see at many of these events, they like the way that he's been speaking directly to some issues that right. they say are, are very much top of mind for them. He has directly addressed reparations and says frequently that he wants to create a commission on race and justice. He says that that is a very top issue for him, that America needs to repair a lot of its racial divisions and he really speaks earnestly about mm -hmm. wanting to do that. Um, he hasn't really discussed exactly cash reparations, which right. is a question that I've asked him directly about <laughs> a few times, and that is you know, a, a concern that some voters do bring up. But overall, mm -hmm. um, it's his comments about reparations, it's his focus on HBCUs right. and his desire to put billions of dollars toward their funding. 
those are things that voters are taking seriously, even among white voters as well, too, the ones who are looking for a moderate, someone who's not on the more progressive wing of the party, who's not Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. but who's also not Joe Biden, yeah. because some of those folks tell us, yes, we know him, we recognize him, he's been around for a while. I don't want to feel obligated to vote for somebody. And I feel like that's a conversation that maybe the Biden campaign wasn't expecting, that they mm -hmm. kind of were thinking, you know, these people already know us, they're going to feel comfortable with us. But I think that, you know, there's been kind of a level of expectation. And so Tom Steyer presents himself as an alternative. And then, Jamie, really quick to move on, but uh, you had a recent story about just how people are feeling about how he's spending money within the yeah. black community. What are the thoughts there? What's, what's the tension there? Yeah, I mean, so it, it, we, we've been hearing, I think, for a long time, you know, sort of ripples of concern. It's getting louder and louder the higher he gets in the polls that just like, you know, this is a party that is opposed theoretically and has been for many years to the undue influence of money in politics, right? And doesn't mm -hmm. want to see uh, folks with, with outsized resources having an, an advantage and getting to have more say in the political process. And that's what is happening, right? Is mm -hmm. you have a billionaire who has come in to South Carolina and has been, you know, as we say, inundating the airwaves, overflowing mailboxes, you know, paying legislators high sums of money to join his campaign and to endorse him, uh, you know, paying black-owned media huge amounts of money uh, for advertising, and they then write gushing editorials, and that leads to more support, too. And a lot of folks just say this is an unfair advantage, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it strikes them as, as, you know, wrong in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, now, he's been lucky in some ways that Mike Bloomberg has gotten into the race. Um, maybe not in the long run, but in this particular in state. South Carolina. Because it has meant that all of the other candidates have trained their fire on him, mm -hmm. the, uh, the much more the wealthy billionaire. billionaire. Yeah. You know, a much wealthier billionaire yeah. than Steyer, to be clear. And so they're saying, this guy is buying the race, and this guy is terrible. Um, and as a result, Steyer's is kind of quietly over here, mm -hmm. rising in South Carolina, and, and doing it with, with all of this money. And so, you know, he has not gotten a ton of scrutiny from, from national news outlets mm -hmm. who have done massive investigations into Bloomberg and Biden, and used to do them into Kamala Harris, Cory Booker. He has not really gotten that, and as a result, he may be able to surprise a lot of people outside of South Carolina. Yeah. As we say, he will not surprise us if he does well. Yeah. Correct. But, but he's kind of slipped under the radar, and it's been interesting to watch. Less than five minutes, we still have a lot to talk about. Yeah. And I'm going to loop all these guys together. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Amy Klobuchar, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, um, what are they looking like in South Carolina? They, you know, they had, you know, when you look at Mayor Pete and look at Amy, they had those strong showings in the early states. They got some momentum from them. Uh, Senator, Elizabeth, Senator Elizabeth Warren really hasn't performed as people thought she was going to. Uh, she's now pulling ads out of South Carolina. What are, what's the path forward for several of these other candidates? Of, you know are also being on the ballot, too. It's hard to really know exactly what that path is. We've seen ads come up in recent days for Senator Amy Klobuchar, which is something that is new here in South Carolina. So she is clearly trying to, like we were saying about Tom Steyer, appeal to more moderate voters here. Same with Mayor Pete. A lot of those, ideal, if, if we can consider voters ideological, which sometimes I don't know if we really can, but on that spectrum, he falls more into that pathway. Mm -hmm. He has been campaigning here, not super recently, but he has been here more recently than some of the other candidates. Oh. And I do believe that we'll be seeing more out of him, specifically focusing on the African-American community, where he knows he has ground to make up, but seems to be speaking earnestly when he says, this is something that I really want to try to do in South Carolina. For Elizabeth Warren, I'm not as sure. She popped into town, was mm -hmm. in Charleston very briefly recently, but aside from that, we haven't really seen much of her here. And it's, it's kind of hard to know how much of an effort she's really going to be making, particularly given her performance in some of the other early states. She's had some surrogates that I think are perhaps more powerful than your typical surrogates. Black Women mm -hmm. For, this, this group of uh, black women activists have been all over the state for her and, you know, can speak, you know, more directly than a lot of surrogates can to the experiences, to the lives of of some South Carolina voters. Uh, but, you know, as we've said, that's never going to make up for um, a, a lack of the candidate themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Warren uh, may have just peaked at the wrong time, right? There was a moment in November when mm -hmm. it looked like she was the certain candidate in mm -hmm. South Carolina and she was the one who was going to give Joe Biden a run for his money. Um, but, you know, as she started coming under m more scrutiny um, and as, uh, you know, there was, of course, that tussle with her and Bernie Sanders that may mm -hmm. have turned off some, some folks on the left, um, you know, it's it's gotten it's gotten more difficult for her, and you have seen some of these other candidates make a play for this. One other thing I would just say is that 
what we are hearing from voters across the ideological spectrum is that their number one concern is beating Donald Trump mm -hmm. and who is going to be mm -hmm. the most electable candidate, who is going to be the most likely to beat him. And I still do hear from voters who, uh, you know, they, they understand, they, they, they will openly say, I know that this may seem sexist, but mm -hmm. I'm still concerned about the idea of a woman. I may want to vote for a woman, right? Mm -hmm. This is the old neighbor mm -hmm. thing, yeah. you know, but I don't know if my neighbor is ready right. to vote and for a woman. Looking forward. We've got one uh, minute left, yeah. right. uh, and I want to mention that we are taping this Wednesday. Uh, we don't have the Winthrop poll out yet. We right. can't talk about the, what happened at the debate with Mike Bloomberg on stage. A lot of things happening, uh, so we'll get some more clarity uh, you know, going forward Hopefully. here. Right. But with about a minute left, we got. We still want to know, uh, President Donald Trump might be coming to town Correct. next oh week. My. And then also, Jim <laughs> Clyburn hasn't endorsed. So really quick, yes. big what's going to happen on. with Jim Clyburn if he endorses Meg? Is that going to be that, as big of an endorsement? It, it could be a big boost for somebody. It could be his opportunity just to kind of weigh in and say, all right, well, you know, this is, this is kind of the person that I, I think I might want to see. But he has said, if that happens, it's going to happen after the South Carolina debate. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be able to have that as information. As far as President Donald Trump coming, That'll just be a really fun thing for us to deal we'll with while, we, on top while we're scampering around right the state with the Democrats. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Jay. Uh, and, uh, gotta you let know, it go. On Saturday, uh, Saturday, the Nevada caucuses. Yeah. Everyone, next few days is going to be there. Come Sunday morning, it here. is all South Carolina. So for look a alive, week. South Carolina. <laughs> Thanks to Megan and Jamie for being here, and thank you for joining us. And be sure to join us as we break down the primary election results live on South Carolina ETV and South Carolina Public Radio Saturday, February 29th. And check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a political podcast can be found on your podcast app on any mobile device. Each week, I recap the weekly political news with the reporters who cover it, like these guys. From the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio on the campus of the University of South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson.